Um, so people have all kinds of fantastic ideas about what may be possible. And you, you heard from Stan that the long tubes and machines and so on. Uh, this is from uh, Robert Forward, who is one of the earliest workers on interferometers uh, close to the beach in California. And this was the, you know, late, late 1960s and early 1970s when uh, it was a very free culture and people were open-minded. And so he, he had this kind of concept that perhaps we can have a three-dimensional interferometer in all kinds of directions. And I think this is the most futuristic thing I've seen. So everything I will talk about today is less difficult than this. So this is the outline. Um, some, some facts, real scientific facts, and then uh, broad speculation about things which don't exist. So this is a, a timeline of where we are and uh, where we were. So if you recall, the first bar detectors built by Joseph Weber in the 60s and then improving throughout the 70s. Uh, here I show the strain sensitivity of these devices over time. These red blocks are the sensitivity of the bar detectors. This is just the first one and the last one. They have several orders of magnitude in a few decades. These blue ones are the laser interferometers which started first in 1971. Uh, slowly increased or quickly increased in sensitivity. And then there is a somewhat plateau here. Uh, th these are the results from the uh, Caltech 40 meter lab. And then around the time that I started in this field, the large kilometer size detectors were built and there was a, another phase change and the sensitivity increased quickly. Uh, around this time, we had our first discussions with the Indigo group about what should we do how could we get a detector in India? Um, the second generation interferometers, as we expect them to be, after some years of work, should have a sensitivity around so, a factor of three to five better than the previous ones. And then if we think about uh, conventional technology and how that might improve, uh, improve into the future, there is some, some, somewhat of a modest improvement over time, but recall that this is a logarithmic scale, so even though this looks incremental, it's, it's quite dramatic in the astrophysical sensitivity. Uh, this is an overview of the advanced LIGO system, and uh, I, I'm quite sure when the LIGO India is installed, the situation will be better than this, but this is, this is probably the worst that things could be when the Indian interferometer comes online. So these are the fundamental noise sources. And here, uh, I'll, I'll just describe a bit what they are. These dashed ones, they're dashed, which means don't pay attention to them. It's not important. Only the solid lines are solid. Uh, the black one is the sum of all of our known contributions. And there's some things here at low frequencies. But the main thing to take away from this is there's this purple trace and there's this red trace. And those are somewhat dominant. The red one comes from uh, fluctuations in the mirror surface due to the fluctuation dissipation theorem of uh, Callan and Welton. And I'll describe that a bit later. But the main point to get is that when things are working correctly and we've bypassed all of the technical problems, which we have not, but I, this is an optimistic futuristic talk. So, Let's imagine we've fixed all of the technical problems. In that uh, wonderful day, uh, we should be limited at nearly all frequencies by this so-called quantum fluctuations. And uh, we usually don't talk about this because we think about the detector as a classical system. But in the end, the quantum na nature of the electromagnetic field is a limit to how good we can do. So I, I'll, I'll spend a lot of time uh, I'll describe it, uh, but this is a topic that I'm learning myself, so it's a kind of shaky explanation as you go through. We'll see. Uh, so yeah, so as, as I said, we're not yet at this uh, wonderful future. This black solid line here, here I've put as a dashed line. So in the previous picture where I was thinking of only calculations, it seemed very solid. But here in the world of reality where we measure the true strain sensitivity, this uh, goal of uh, fundamental limit seems a little bit hazy, so I've changed it to dash. Uh, middle of 2014, uh, 
the team in uh, Louisiana in LIGO was able to get the interferometer running, and the sensitivity to the binary black hole sources, of which we've detected one, uh, was two megaparsecs at that time. And it seemed very exciting. We were really very impressed with how close we were, only a factor of 1,000 or so from the fundamental limits. And I say that because the last time that this happened in 2001 and 2002, we started off a factor of 100,000 away from the fundamental limit. So it was already a good sign that the advanced LIGO interferometers were really well designed. And then the progress was extremely fast. We have gotten to within a factor of a few of the final sensitivity in just roughly one, one and a half years. And by comparison, it took, uh, five years to get to the equivalent point in the initial LIGO system. I said a uh, black hole, I said, right? This is the binary black hole that we saw. So this is the roughly 30 solar mass pair. <clears throat> and uh, the sensitivity of the interferometers was roughly like this brown, uh, uh, rough, a hashy thing at the time of the detection, 600 megaparsecs. This is uh, averaged over the sky. And now after a few months of work, uh, we've improved it by this 15% uh, or something like that. And so now uh, the Louisiana interferometer is more like this blue line and you can see for the late stage of the in spiral and the merger waves and the ring down, we would have much better sensitivity. Uh, unfortunately, we we saw no black hole in the last day before we shut it off. So at the moment, it's shut down and uh, uh, being repaired a bit. We hope to get better. Um, Stan mentioned something about the ring down a few days ago. And if you look at this part of the signal around uh, 250 hertz where the ring down happened, uh, you can see that there's some noise which is not smooth. So it, likely doesn't come from any fundamental source. It's just some instrumental artifacts. Uh, even worse, if you wanted to constrain the next harmonic at 360 hertz, uh, the noise in the Hanford detector was extremely large. It's not shown here, but maybe a factor of five or so larger due to some mechanical resonances in the system. Um, so here, uh, what I've done is used, um, th this is not like the published result, this is some signal processing, which we've done later as we learn how to do things. Uh, so I've zoomed in to the late stage of the in spiral. Uh, the yellow trace, which is a bit difficult to see, is the calculated template. And the purple trace is uh, the template with some filtering applied to it, which is the same filtering which I've applied to the data. So you can see by the difference between the yellow and the purple trace, the effect of the filter is, is not very severe. There's no dephasing. There's a small change in the amplitude here at the higher frequencies. Uh, and, this, and this is the data. The red and the blue are, are the data. And you can see, if you look at it, maybe it's a bit difficult on the screen, but after the peak of the signal, there are a few cycles in the data. And then in this region, it's difficult to make out if anything is going on because we're limited by the uh, instrumental limits. Not just the uh, shot noise of the detector, but mechanical resonances and sort of dirty effects. Um, but this is what can be done sort of with almost the best uh, signal processing we have now. And we have some more ideas of what to do in the future. No. Um, from, this, from all of the signals, I've removed the mean. Uh, and then the timing, um, I'm not in charge of timing, so someone gave me this number to put in there. But I haven't adjusted any other mean or X, X scale of phase. Uh, so uh, this, this is a conversion to PDF Macintosh software. So you can imagine that there is laser beams in the arms. This is not an intentional piece of the animation. It's been reduced in my PDF making. Uh, this is the same diagram, roughly, that you saw from, from Stan yesterday. Uh, although it says 200 watt laser here, at the moment what we're using is the same as the enhanced LIGO laser, which is the 
laser we installed in 2007 as part of a, up, a small upgrade to the initial LIGO. We're using the same thing we're talking about at the moment. Um, and the reason for that is we've had some failure of one of the lasers, and as Dan mentioned, we are not quite sure how to handle the higher laser power at the, at the moment. Uh, in a few places, I've left uh, multiple numbers here. This is 100 kilowatts, 800 kilowatts, 20, 30, and so on. This is just to say we are operating right now in an intermediate mode, which we think is easier, uh, but we have some more easy changes to, well, r roughly easy changes to do, which we think will improve the sensitivity. At the moment, the power in the arms, which is the main indicator of how well we can measure the displacement of the mirrors, is only 100 kilowatts, and the ultimate limits of what we get, get to at 800 kilowatts. Roughly speaking, the sensitivity will square, uh, scale like the square root of this power. So we can get some square root of eight if things scale as we expect. I, I want to say some details now about the simple picture of uh, how interferometry works. And it's important to think of how did this start. Uh, uh, People mentioned to me before how in university you may set up your first Michelson interferometer and see these fringes when you touch it. And when you clap or shake the table, you can see some interference. This is the, uh, one of the Michelson interferometers from a uh, little over 100 years ago. There's Michelson. Um, they were making measurements which are at the lower end of the Lisa frequency band by looking at the rotation of the Earth. And so it's extremely challenging to make uh, low phase noise measurements there. But at the time, or, or not for the initial paper, but sort of by the end before Michelson stopped working on it, uh, Morley went off by himself and found some ether eventually. But uh, before that split happened, they were able to resolve one thousandth of a wavelength. And it was an extremely precise measurement and done before the invention of lasers. So it's, a, to me, a, a very impressive and uh, mysteriously good result. Um, so these days, uh, this is a bit more complete picture of the interferometer. We, we have the same thing. We have a light source, the beam is split in two and comes back. But we don't look at the interference uh, pattern. The beams are overlapped precisely so that there, in principle there's no pattern. It's either bright or dark or, or some mix in between. And here is a plot showing what we see on the detector if we move one of the mirrors uh, linearly. As we change the displacement uh, in units of wavelength here, uh, the uh, port becomes bright, dark, bright, and dark, and so on. And we see just the uh, periodicity due to the wavelength. Uh, the optical phase that we accrue in the arms uh, is like this, 2 pi over lambda times the difference in the length. The way that the phase shift works for the gravitational waves uh, strain is so, so the change in phase per strain is disproportional to the length. Uh, this is telling us how the power depends on the length, but we can also convert that into phase. So the power here uh, at the detection port goes like the input power times sine squared of the phase. And the derivative depends upon where do you sit on this thing. So people often say that we sit, we are making a null measurement or the dark fringe or these kinds of words, that's a myth. Uh, if we set at the bottom here, obviously, there would, nothing would work because there is no derivative, so it's not possible. In fact, uh, I couldn't draw the arrow small enough, but um, when this distance is a few hundred nanometers, we, we offset from the minimum by around 10 picometers. So it's extremely, it's almost, it's really very almost accurate to say dark fringe, but not quite, uh, just slightly off. And why, why do we choose that number? Why not one picometer or a thousand picometers? Uh, it's a, just a technical detail, but it has to do with the fact that the beams which return back here and overlap don't perfectly cancel. And so we find some place where the optical signal, the derivative, is big enough so we can measure something, yet the power which gets to the detector is not so large that it destroys our equipment or that the Poisson statistics from having too many photons there overwhelms the signal. So it's just some technical trade-off, nothing, nothing magical. Oh. This, is, this is the story of my life. I can't get enough laser power into the arms. This is wherever I go, this happens. Uh, so 
<clears throat> pretend that there's laser beams here again. Uh, this is a cartoon of how the other noise sources work in the system. Uh, I'll get to this part last. So here I've excluded laser noise. And why do I do that? Um, it's one of those things which people don't consider to be fundamental. But it is one of those things which we spend, you know, it's out of almost infinite number of man hours to solve this problem. But once it's solved, we just ignore it because it's not, it's sort of somehow not interesting anymore. But uh, if you think about why do we have this shape at all? Why is there a Michelson shape? Well, it's not, it's not because the Michelson interferometer is well matched to the quadrupolar uh, nature of the gravitational wave strain, although that's a happy coincidence. It's because there's nowhere on Earth where we can find a laser which is stable enough to make a strain measurement. So if you'd like to make a strain measurement of the space of 10 to the minus 23, you need to have a laser with a stability of one part in 10 to the 24, or else all that you will measure is the laser wavelength fluctuation. And when you go to the laser store with uh, $100,000 in your wallet and say, hello, laser store man, please sell me your finest laser, uh, the best that you can get is something like one part in 10 to the 12 for the stability these days. And although uh, um, w when this effort began, um, I don't know, Dan maybe knows, lasers were not even really lasers. They were somewhere between light bulb and laser in terms of frequency width. So I can't even comprehend of those times. So I start with something which is stable at the level of one part in 10 to the 12, and then we have to achieve this part in 10 to the 24. How do we get 12 orders of magnitude in the laser frequency stability? It's a kind of impossible puzzle. Well, we take the laser and we compare it to something which is stable. And then we feed back on the laser wavelength to make it uh, equal to this reference. And then once we have something which is reasonably stable, we compare it to a slightly better reference. And on and on and on. And with each comparison, we get a, we get a strong signal which says uh, how much the laser is still fluctuating. And we feed back to stabilize the wavelength better and better and better. Finally, we make, by making the laser resonate uh, within these two arms, we take the average difference between the laser and this arm and this arm, the average of those two, and that gives us uh, a stability which is equivalent to the stability of these arms. Um, and that gets us to a level of 10 to the minus 21 or so, which is still not good enough. But because we have the Michelson nature of this, the laser wavelength variations are canceled by the symmetric nature of the arms. And the best polishing and manufacturing that we can do makes the arms balance to about one part in 300. And so that gives us the final uh, uh, wavelength noise rejection. So that's uh, extremely complicated and labor intensive work. But now that it's working, I, you know, besides verbally here, I don't really talk about it. Um, similarly, we have to suppress the laser amplitude fluctuations. Because if you have uh, excess noise uh, like that, um, it's a disturbance. It shakes things around. And in our world, uh, because there's so much laser power here in this arm cavity, uh, the actual radiation pressure from the laser amplitude fluctuations will push the mirrors around and mask the gravitational wave in the low part of the audio band. So that also has to be stabilized, but uh, not quite as much. It's only to one part in 10 to the 8 or 10 to the 9. And the reason that's so... Uh, uh, less severe than the frequency or, or wavelength constraint is that essentially what we're doing is making a phase measurement of the uh, light field, not an amplitude measurement. So we can afford to have a lot of fluctuation in the amplitude in this space. Uh, anyhow, there are a few of these other things. The mirrors are shaken by the seismic noise. Uh, there's some gas uh, in the tubes, which turns out to be not an insignificant source of noise. I think this is the, how close my voice is getting when I turn my head. Put it in the center. Put it in my hand. Other side, okay. Maybe I can get a gain increase.
Uh, so the LIGO interferometers are unique among the ones in the world in that a large amount of effort and money was spent to make the vacuum truly vacuum. And that investment turns out to be uh, very fortuitous because it gives us the ability to expand into the future. And so the future is optimistic rather than pessimistic. But even so, this is, this is still quite close to where we hope to get. And so it's not, uh, not something to ignore. Uh, but today I want to focus just on these two things, the vacuum fluctuations of the E field and the thermodynamic fluctuations of the mirror surface. I think those are interesting. Uh, they're interesting challenges, and I think as it turns out, uh, with enough uh, brain power applied to these problems, we can overcome these challenges and overcome them to such an extent that we, you know, with Earth-based detectors, we would have deep cosmological reach and be able to do high fidelity measurements of the black hole, uh, black hole perturbation. Um, yeah, I, since I don't have a slide on it, I'll just, I'll just use my hands to describe what I mean by vacuum fluctuations of the E field. Maybe that's the best. Uh, what is it, what's it mean, vacuum fluctuation? So we know uh, if there's no field here, if there's no laser beam, then the electromagnetic field in this piece of space is in the ground state. And the ground state just means that the expectation value of the E field is zero. But what it doesn't tell you about is the fluctuation. If you look at the expectation value of the electric field squared, you find it's a non-zero. It's just a, a feature of quantum mechanics. And in this situation, what does it mean? Um, well, you can think about this in terms of the field at this point in space, this point in space, and so on. And at each coordinate, you can ask, what's the fluctuation in the electromagnetic field? And you can, you can have this, but you can also reimagine this electromagnetic field fluctuation in terms of propagating waves going in the two, two directions. And that's, that's what's useful in this picture. So we have the laser, which is input from here. So there's no vacuum fluctuation coming in from this side. What we're sending in on this side is the coherent, coherent state due to the laser. And even though, and, and there's all this laser noise uh, stabilization which I described. Uh, and then on top of that, because the system is so large, we have these resonant systems, there's a passive filtering of the laser noise. So even what was there would be filtered away and it's not a problem. Uh, the only other place where the light can get in, uh, roughly speaking, is backwards through this way. The signal does come out here, and as I said, there is around, uh, uh, we, we have this offset of 10 picometers or so, and the amount of light which comes out of here when we're in the operating mode is about twice as much as this laser pointer. This is a five milliwatts, and there's something like 10 milliwatts coming out if things are working well. Uh, but that's in this direction, and in this direction, going backwards, there's nothing. And by nothing, I mean it's, it's the ground state of the EM field which is going back in. So that's the propagating field going back. And it means that uh, you have the ground state coming into here. It splits at this beam splitter, goes into here and goes into here. And part of it also reflects and comes back. And so when you ask uh, what's going on here at the detector, we have the sum of the two fields. One field is the static uh, field coming out of the system along with the gravitational wave. And that's added to the part of the ground state field which goes in and comes back. And you sum those two, uh, and, you, and you take the magnitude squared in order to find what's the power. And if you ask what's the fluctuations there, the fluctuations come entirely from the fluctuations of the ground state of the EM field. Uh, and that is what leads to shot noise, the fluctuations which happen at the zero crossings of the, of the static electromagnetic field. Uh, the radiation pressure fluctuations, which you can think about as the quantum back action in the Heisenberg microscope picture of things, that the more photons you put onto your system, there's more disturbance of the state. That comes from the amplitude uh, quadrature of the vacuum E field fluctuations entering into the system, going in here, and then beating with the static electromagnetic field, which is in the eye. And the beating of the ground state fluctuations with the static field is what gives rise to the back action noise. That's more or less it. And in that picture, you get the same answer as you would thinking about things, uh, thinking about, um, well, there's several pictures of how to calculate the quantum noise, but this one is the interesting one when you, later as we will get into uh, how to avoid this kind of quantum, quantum fluctuation in the measurement. So 
nothing here I described is nonlinear. This is just uh, linear, uh, there's the harmonic oscillator picture of the electromagnetic field, and there's linear reflection and transmission at each of these surfaces. So the mathematics at each piece of this is simple. Um, individually, it gets a bit complicated when we think about how to find solutions for this. But that's the picture here. Uh, so I, I showed you this a bit before. There's all these different sources. This dashed line here um, is the integrand for uh, binary neutron star sources. And here, um, I particularly exaggerated this green trace, which is called the Newtonian gravity mode. And I, I did this because uh, um, Jan Harms is here, and I like to just irritate him sometimes. So I put something incorrect, and then when he gives his talk next, it will be correct. Uh, anyway, the point here is to say, when you think about where does the signal come from in this kind of uh, advanced LIGO system, uh, it's peak in this area, uh, 30 hertz to 100 hertz or something. And because the in spiral doesn't spend very much time after 100 hertz, it quickly passes here and merges. Uh, this area, although it contains a lot of interesting physics, doesn't contribute to our possibility of making the detection. Once we're in the regime where we're making many detections, of course we care about improving this, but at the beginning, when we have no binary neutron stars, we should focus on this, this band to see what the real population is. Um, okay, so I described a bit uh, of the existing interferometers and the quantum fluctuations, um, and, and also showed where we are today with respect to where we can get to. Now I want to talk a little bit about this future. Where, where we go next? Uh, well, there's, there's three things. Um, as I said, I won't describe this Newtonian gravity, but it's one of the three pillars of making the improvement. Uh, if you look at this thing, um, you can see that if we were to improve just the thermodynamic fluctuations of the mirror by itself, it wouldn't help that much because we're limited by the quantum mechanical noise at all frequencies. And similarly, if you improve the quantum mechanical noise, it does help here for the in-spiral part of the binary, and it does help up here for the merger of, merger ring down of low mass sources, but right here in the middle where we see the, the late stage in-spiral and merger of these uh, medium mass black holes, uh, we cannot make much improvement without improving the thermal noise. And so that's why these are the two, two important ones. So for the quantum field, um, we can use the so-called uh, squeeze light technique, which introduces correlations uh, yeah, I shouldn't say in the vacuum field. We put in a specially prepared state of uh, the electromagnetic field. It's not the vacuum field. It's a state of the field which has uh, correlations between the photons such that the fluctuations and the amplitude and the phase are not equal. And so you can put more of the, uh, not, let's think about a geometrical way to say it. The Heisenberg uncertainty relationship tells you that uh, delta x, delta p, the position and the momentum, when you multiply those two, they have to be greater than or equal to h bar over two. And that tells you something like, it describes a geometrical shape like a circle or an ellipse. And it says that the area of this ellipse has to be conserved. But it doesn't tell you about the semi-major axis or so on. So the, the reason that it's called squeezing is that you can engineer the, the light field so that you have correlations and you get a uh, elongated ellipse rather than a circle. Um, and so it's not quite the vacuum field. There is there's some light there. Um, another way that we can engineer correlations is by using optomechanical feedback. I said that the interferometer is oh, a lot of variation. Maybe I, instead of turning my neck, I just turn my whole body. Uh, so th there's this optomechanical feedback. I, I mentioned that things are linear. They, they are so, uh, but if you look at this picture, um, the mirrors are here and they're physical bodies with some sort of mass. And so when you apply a fluctuating uh, power onto them or a fluctuating force, they move. And as a result, the, the field which gets reflected from them uh, has a phase shift. And that allows you to put in a correlation between the amplitude and the phase of the electromagnetic field. And it allows you to put in correlations between the fluctuations, which is important for this. Um, 
The other trick that you can play is by having optical cavities. And if you're at the resonance of an optical cavity, which has a sort of a Lorentzian line shape, then if you change the phase of the field, the first order, there's no change in the amplitude. However, if your cavity is slightly off resonance, you're at the edge of the Lorentzian, you get a first order coupling between the phase and the amplitude. And now, due to the finite mass of the mirror and the fact that you can have things off resonance, means you have a way to produce correlations in the field by having amplitude fluctuations turn into phase fluctuations and phase fluctuations back into amplitude. You have now a way to make a feedback loop and engineer this type of squeezing. Uh, so that's the second, second uh, technique we can, we can use. Um, this is all limited by the fact that there is a uh, terrible uh, way that we get decoherence in our system. If you've, if you've produced a highly correlated state of the light and now you send it in to a, a well-polished, perfect mirror, the field completely reflects and there's no problem. But if I send instead uh, my electric field into uh, Rajesh, uh, the amount which gets reflected back from me is pretty small and there's a lot of decoherence because he's not a perfect mirror. And the way to think about it is that he is a coupling mechanism for the vacuum modes all through space to come into his shirt and then bounce back at me. And so the field which returns is a tiny part still this coherent correlated state, but it's mostly the ground state fluctuations from the environment. And in the same way, um, all mirrors are some mixture of ideal mirrors and somebody's shirt. So they, they're just, they have some roughness associated with it. And so that's some admixture of the vacuum fields and the perfect state that you send in. So we need some way to reduce this. And a simple way to do it is to say, well, the mirror roughness has some characteristic spatial scale and some characteristic height. If we use a longer laser wavelength, uh, the apparent fluctuations of the roughness are smaller. Um, there's a lot of details to the simulation of this, but more or less that's it. Uh, how about the mirror thermodynamic fluctuations? Well, we know um, uh, just like the, uh, voltage fluctuations in a resistor or the mechanical fluctuations in a uh, mass spring system, uh, the power spectrum of the fluctuations goes like the temperature and therefore the effective strain fluctuations, the square root of the power spectral density is just proportional to the temperature. So if we cool the whole interferometer to absolute zero, you wouldn't have any of this temperature fluctuation cut through. Um, as it turns out, um, just from an engineering standpoint, operating a system at absolute zero is extremely challenging and no one's ever achieved absolute zero. Um, you might think, let's go very close to absolute zero. You know, the best experiments with uh, macroscopic objects can reach something like a few to 10 millikelvin on Earth with uh, things of this size. It's true, you can do that, uh, but at that temperature, if you have a tiny bit of heat input, the temperature changes dramatically. And as you recall, we want to have uh, of order one megawatt of laser power in the arms. Um, if, if, you, if you're not familiar with the way that laser heating works, um, so I say this laser is around five milliwatts or so in power, it means even if I were to point it into my eye, it doesn't do a lot of damage. You just, it's hard to see for a while. Um, if instead I have um, 100 milliwatts or so of green light, it's enough, uh, if I focus it enough, it can burn the hair off of my arm. If I had uh, one watt, it puts holes in shirts. I, I know from first-hand experience. Um, in the regime from 10 to 40 watts, um, it's really very painful if you stick your hand into, depending upon the absorbance of different parts of your skin and so on. So don't do it. And uh, when we get to the level of megawatts, I can only imagine, but I think it just blows your head right off. That's my estimate. Um, so there's a lot of heat input if you have any absorption. It's to be avoided. And so you, you can't solve this problem completely just by lowering the temperature, although uh, we will lower the temperature somewhat. Um, the other point is about the mechanical cue of the system. Uh, so as Stan mentioned yesterday, uh, the, region, the reason that we have this kind of uh, so much of this thermal fluctuation is due to the equal partition theorem. We have an extended body that has 
uh, almost Avogadro's number of mechanical modes to it. And those modes are not just at low frequency at the uh, several kilohertz that you would expect for a large object like this, but those modes extend all the way out into the infrared. And at hundreds of gigahertz, you still have modes which are contributing to the noise at the lowest frequencies. So when you think about what you measure, if you look at the surface at um, 100 hertz or something, it's a kind of incoherent superposition of the noise from all of these modes. However, um, if you had a system with a perfectly uh, infinity mechanical Q, it would mean that all of the thermal energy would be concentrated uh, just in those modes, and there wouldn't be any uh, leakage from, of the energy from those other modes into the measurement band. So we're in a regime where the Q is very good, around 10 to the 8, and so it's uh, enormously well uh, isolated into those modes, but not perfectly. Um, and uh, so uh, the, propos the proposal, uh, one of the proposals for the future uh, of the LIGO facilities is to put in a few new materials and to cool the system down. So we would replace the mirrors um, from 40 kilograms of silica glass to 200 kilogram pieces of single crystal silicon. We would cool the system to 123 degrees Kelvin. Uh, this is a magic number uh, for silicon. At this temperature precisely, uh, there's, uh, the thermal expansion coefficient goes to zero, and there's a whole host of other thermodynamic noises which completely go away because of this fortuitous uh, zero, zero point in the thermal expansion. This is also a temperature at which uh, the black body radiation from this uh, mirror, you imagine 200 kilograms, you know, it's something like this. The black body radiation from a mass of that size is around 10 watts. So that means in thermal equilibrium, if the laser power that you're absorbing is less than 10 watts, you can keep this system operating cryogenically without touching it with any cryogen. You just surround it with a, you know, the, the chamber in which you're holding it has to be black and it has to be a bit less than 100 degrees Kelvin. And then it's completely cooled without touching. And so there's no excess vibration from having cryogen. Um, at that level, we can increase the laser power quite a bit by a factor of four or something. The thermal conductivity of silicon is so high that there's no thermal gradients, thermal destabilization, um, and, and a few of these other parameters. But basically, the, the heart of the thing is changing these optical cavities into this cryogenic silicon. Um, let me just skip ahead since I'm running out of time. Um, what we expect, if we take into account a lot of these calculations and some of the technology that Jan will talk about is that we would get a factor of four or a bit more improvement on top of the advanced LIGO here in this minimum. And this has been, you know, this design has changed a bit in the last year to focus more on this population of black holes. Um, it's not to say that there's no, there's no neutron stars or there'll never be any neutron stars, but if it, if it turns out to be the case that the mechanism is such uh, stars collapse, they go through the neutron stage, neutron star stage directly to black holes, and we find the excess population of black holes and less neutron stars. This may be more advantageous than improving the sensitivity. Anyhow, this is, it's not built yet, but this is just a picture of what's possible. Factor of four on top of the advanced LIGO in the existing facilities is something really, I think, spectacular for us astrophysicists, and it's something that we could have in a short amount of time because a limited number of hardware upgrades. Um, yeah, as Anna Satya mentioned, um, in terms of the cosmological reach, it becomes uh, significant at the redshift of 57. Um, this is to put it in context with the rest of the upgrades in the world. Um, this green curve is the expected sensitivity of the Einstein D, not, not quite what Satya was showing, but uh, I hadn't seen his slide, so I was guessing. This is the best I could get. It's, it's pretty close here at this band, but the, the place where the larger detectors like Einstein telescope and so on really excel is down here below 10 hertz. And this extra factor of a few may not sound like a lot if you say a few, but it's, a, it's probably impossible to ever get this using the technology we have now. And so having the larger detectors is really advantageous if we want to detect binary neutron stars to the edge of the um, well, 
this was the whole, I now have 25 slides or something on the meat of this, so I've, I've missed my whole uh, point of the talk. I'll, I'll skip through a lot of the introductory stuff, but you can ask, ask questions later. Uh, so I mentioned um, there's this picture, the input field, output field. When we think about the vacuum fluctuations, uh, in that uh, world of uh, people who do theoretical work on quantum measurement, they consider the vacuum field to be the input field. And the output field is the field which contains the signal and the vacuum fluctuations. Um, uh, so usually uh, the ground state has equal fluctuations in both the amplitude and phase quadrature. And so if you look at this uncertainty ellipse, you'll see it's sort of equal in both. It looks like a usual symmetric uh, Gaussian. Um, and uh, just as with the Heisenberg microscope picture, if we increase the laser power, we're able to get better resolution of the test mass, less uh, uh, measurement noise in the high frequency band, but the back action uh, noise is, is larger, and so the low frequency uh, motion is increased. That's the basic picture. Um, skipping on and on. Um, so in the last year or so, we started to re-examine this and wonder how, could, how good could we do fundamentally, given uh, th this came, it came mainly from a discussion with John, John Friedman at a gravity conference. But he helped us to think about this in a more fundamental way, which is imagine you have a sack full of mirrors and as many lasers as you want, and you have this, some amount of space to play in. What, what's the best thing you could do? What's the best way to arrange things so that you can get the maximum amount of information bits out of the space time? That, that's the appropriate question. And we started thinking, what's the real fundamental limit of this? Does it have anything to do with uh, the topology of the system, or what's the laser wavelength, or so these things? And no, it, it's not really. Um, it has to do just with this uh, simple picture of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Here, recast, instead of position momentum, we're thinking about the electromagnetic field and the phase. And so, uh, if you didn't know anything else about all this quantum stuff, if you just knew this from your first course in quantum mechanics, you'd say, of course, if I'd like to make a very good phase measurement of the space-time strain, the way to do it is uh, to put this delta E on this side, on the right-hand side of the equation, and then to maximize E. We don't have freedom to change H bar yet, and uh, what we do have freedom to do is to change uh, the fluctuation in the field amplitude. Um, so what we like is a design where we have a huge fluctuation in the field amplitude, which is sourced entirely by quantum fluctuations. So I, I talked before about how we can have possibly this feedback system. And the point of the feedback system is to positively enhance the fluctuations in the amplitude quadrature. And as long as they're sourced purely by the quantum noise, the phase fluctuations must be going down. And that seems a bit counterintuitive. Why would you like a system with a huge laser power fluctuations all the time? It seems unstable. But in fact, this is what the, the equations tell you. Is that, I mean, equations could be wrong. Um, let me skip to this other picture. Um, this is a thing that uh, Yuri Levin explained to us a few years ago, which is if you'd like to have a really good uh, receiver, people in the electromagnetic community know this, if you'd like to have a really good receiver of electromagnetic radiation, the way that you do it is by designing something which is a very efficient radiator of electromagnetic radiation. And it's the same situation for us. If we want to have a system which has a very, you know, we don't know how to increase the cross-section, uh, sort of the scattering cross-section for the gravitational waves. When the wave comes through, because any matter that we can use on the Earth is so light, um, there's almost no energy deposited within our system. We'd need to have an L shape, uh, just uh, an L made of black hole material in order to have a high absorbance for black holes or, or for gravitational waves. So we can't do that, but we can, we can try to work on the other side. We can increase the signal, but we can reduce the noise. Um, and so I said we'd like to have a large amplitude fluctuation. Well, in this radiator picture, it becomes really natural. Um, imagine that I put a laser into the system from the detection port, so I, I put this switch, and I put in a lot of amplitude fluctuation. Well, what happens? Um, in this part where there's a lot of power stored, um, the Maxwell stress energy tensor for the field is fluctuating a lot. 
you get gravitational radiation from that. And then the test masses, because they're suspended by wires, are also moving back and forth. And the quadrupole moment of the full uh, four kilometer system is fluctuating. So the fluctuation of the field gives you a fluctuation in the position of the masses, and it gives you a lot of, not a lot of radiation, it gives you a tiny amount of radiation, but if you use this as a design uh, uh, thought, you can think about how to design your system so that you get an optimum reception, meaning an optimum signal to noise ratio precisely at the frequencies that you want. Um, so this work, I mean, the mathematics works. It seems like it should work. We don't yet know of any technical limitation to this, although surely there's a technical limitation. We can't get infinity. Um, uh, let me skip ahead. Uh, so I showed you this just a minute ago. This is what we could do with um, some technical improvements to the existing LIGO system. If we're able to put in the full um, uh, back action canceling by having this really optimal, optomechanical feedback in the system, the difference would be something like this, that the quantum noise would be out of the picture at, at pretty much all frequencies. It would be very dramatic. And then the only thing to solve would be this mirror fluctuation issue. If we could get something like this, I haven't even computed the astrophysical ranges for something like this because it's so tremendously good. It would be, you know, you can see it's an order of magnitude better than what we expect for neutron star equation of state and so on. Um, I should say that this curve is done using an extrapolation of existing technologies, and I think it's, it's quite possible. Um, this one, however, um, it relies on the, it's this magical thing, which is uh, some sort of way to engineer this by putting some very clever optical system within, within our interferometer. We don't have an answer for what this is. And so uh, we have some thoughts about how to do it, um, but what we need here is some people to get involved with uh, doing these calculations to help us to uh, design a better system. But it seems we're very far from the real fundamental limit of information extraction from a space time. Um, well, I was going to tell you some more about space interferometers, but I, I'm trying to put three talks into one talk, so I've run out of time. Um, so I have no conclusion other than to say, uh, I think a, few, a couple of years ago, I thought we were sort of running out of room in terms of technical advances what could, be doing, what could be done on the ground, but um, some advances both in the thermal noise of the mirrors and an understanding of quantum mechanics of the interferometers makes me uh, re-optimistic again. And I think uh, by the time that the LIGO India comes online, we'll be ready uh, you know, quickly to implement a few uh, of these upgrades. And assuming that people have some clever ideas between now and then, we'll be ready to implement a few of these upgrades and the promise of the three detector LIGO network at that time is going to be extremely, it's going to be cosmological reach and really high precision probes of black hole horizon, which is the most, in my opinion, the most exciting uh, uh, scientific output of this field. What would it take to, I mean, uh, what type of experimental advance and how far in the future are we to be able to observe the uh, primordial gravitational waves? Which, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, uh, I always, besides the, the binary black hole problem, that's the, probably the top way to draw physicists into this field is to say uh, we can detect primordial uh, gravitational waves. So it's extremely challenging and the reason, well, first we don't know what the signal looks like, but there's a lot of models which have a, a flat, uh, you know, the scale invariant energy spectrum and if we take some ensemble of these uh, slow roll inflation models, it looks like uh, the, the signal would be so small we need something which is 
um, like this uh, LIGO sensitivity, but at, uh, at this frequency band, something like 0.1 to 1 hertz. And that's pretty much impossible on the Earth. Uh, but it's quite doable in space using a, a small version of the Lisa interferometer. And so I think that, that kind of technology is within our grasp. It's less than 100 years kind of problem. Any other questions? Towards the end of your talk, you mentioned that uh, by the time LIGO India comes up, you would be able to implement some of these technologies. Um, by that, do you mean um, you will need that much time to develop the technologies, or will they be ready? Um, and if they're ready, why not implement them as you build the detector itself? And how much would that tinker the budget? So that's multiple questions. Uh, I think this cryogenic upgrade is of the scale of 100 million dollars. It could be maybe 50, between 50 and 200 million, something. Um, I think, yeah, it, it, it will take us a full eight to 12 years to develop all of that technology for it to be ready. And, uh, you know, to try to take this untested technology and put it in during the installation of the interferometer, I think, is too much of a gamble. The best thing to do is uh, install as is, and we may add a few things like slightly better mirrors and the squeeze light technique, but nothing, nothing really, something safe. And get it online and get the big network running. And then we'll test out these things in the laboratory after some few years, perhaps we put them in, depending on how the R&D goes. Are these technologies uh, very specific to LIGO type experiments, or are they do they have other applications in other uh, fields or disciplines? Yeah, they're very uh, non-specific. Uh, the development of high purity silicon. The reason I chose silicon for this is that uh, there's a multi-billion-dollar industry in the world making super high purity silicon for microchips, for power transistors, uh, and maglev trains. And they've put so much research into this already, it's a shame for us not to use it for pure science. And they're very interested to help us. It's a, it's a dramatic confluence of interest. The things that are making are precisely what we need. Uh, in addition, um, the thin films technology that we need to make uh, precise uh, uh, low fluctuation mirrors, that's a research topic which has been going on for 35 years in the condensed matter community. And they do it because they want to understand the fundamental nature of uh, uh, phonon scattering and thin film two-dimensional systems. But it's, it's just now coming up to the place where it's dramatically useful for us. And then the quantum measurement community is, has become really large in the last 20 years. And I think that was largely spurred by the work in understanding the gravitational wave detectors. But now uh, understanding quantum measurement for a chip scale and inertial for military applications and phones and so on. It's becoming a really broad uh, thing. So there should be uh, lots of ways of uh, getting input from that community and then also having this, this work pay off as uh, useful for industrial development. Okay. If, uh